In this chapter of Job, of uh, surviving tragedies, how to survive tragedies, we're going to be looking at Job's response to God. Now, to remind you where we're at, <clears throat> Job was perfect, upright, he feared God and shunned evil. Nothing was wrong with Job. And the Bible says, be complete, be perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is complete. So obviously, we can attain that. We're not talking about perfection as you think, but completeness in God as He thinks. You got it? Moral, morality. So bad things can happen to good people. Job was a good man. A lot better than all of us this morning. I don't think we can have that said of most of us here this morning, perfect, upright, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and bad things happened to him. Remember, Satan accused Job before God. And he accused Job of serving God just because God did things good to him. He made him wealthy, made him healthy, gave him a good family. Everything was good, no problems. Now remember, Satan is the accuser. Satan is the liar from the beginning and the father of lies. Satan is the destroyer and he is the tempter. That's what he was created for. All right? You may think he's some fallen angel somewhere, but he was created to lie, to accuse, to tempt, to destroy because God cannot lie. God cannot do harm. God cannot do evil. And so Satan does it for him. Are you there? Okay. <clears throat> so, God gave Satan permission. See, Satan can't do anything without God's permission. He gave him permission to destroy Job's source of wealth, his health, his ten children, his employees, the harmony in his marriage, and he added more widows and orphans when he killed, Satan destroyed his employees. Job already had a welfare program going on. Now it has multiplied immensely. And the mockers were increased. There were people that mocked Job and ridiculed him. Now everybody is mocking him. You, you serve God and this happens? Oh boy, I really, yeah. Making fun of Job. For being one that served God. Then, Job's greatest fear we found was losing his relationship with God, not these tragedies. Job did not fear losing his children, losing his wealth, losing his health, or harmony in the home. What his great fear was, it's, we found, was Job was greatly feared of the presence of the Lord, that he would lose the presence of the Lord. And we found this because it says, Oh, if I could find him, then he would strengthen me, he would answer me, he would not judge me wrongly, he would solve these problems. So Job was looking for God, because when Satan accused Job, God backed off from Job. See, God had a hedge around Job that nothing could touch him. So God backed off. Job had no more communication with God for a season here. And that's what Job didn't want to lose the most, is his communal relationship with God. Isn't that beautiful? Hallelujah. Do we have a ways to go? <laughs> Job didn't sin with his mouth nor charge God foolishly till his friends came along. And accused Job of sin. <clears throat> Without proof of Job's sinning, they said sin brought these tragedies upon Job, and those tragedies came from God. Totally wrong. The tragedies came from Satan. Isn't that right? Yes. And uh, <clears throat> they had no proof. I know a lot of people accuse, even in a marriage, they'll accuse their spouse of something they don't even have any evidence about. They'll accuse their children of something they don't have any evidence about. 
Children accuse the parents. Brothers and sisters in Christ will accuse each other that they have no evidence, <laughs> especially when it comes to doctrine. We want to accuse and attack when we have no proof that they're wrong. Are you there? How many know you got to have evidence, not supposition? And that's what Job's friends did, and so they became his enemy. Elihu spoke to Job and his friends, proving they were wrong for blaming Job, the three friends blaming Job and God, and Job blaming God. He made it clear that these guys were wrong. After listening to chapter after chapter of their discussion between each other, he stood up and he showed them they were wrong. God then came last week in our study and spoke to Job directly, supporting Elihu's facts with God's own facts. Now, and we're going to see Job responding to God, who came and confirmed what Elihu, Elihu's told him and showed Job he was wrong. Okay? Nothing feels safer than Jesus' touch. When God showed up, you get confidence. You get bold. Hallelujah. You don't get fearful of exposing your heart and everything because when he shows up, you know you're in safe hands. And that's why I have this picture of this child embracing Christ. Not, that's just what Job did not want to lose. He did not want to lose his intimate relationship with God. That's what he feared the most. And I submit to you that's what every Christian should fear the most. Is that intimate relationship with God where you can talk with him and touch him. So Job answers the Lord in chapter 42. Who came to perfect Job and told Job his wrongs. Now we're going to see five actions for restoration from tragedies. Five actions that lead to restoration from any tragedy in anyone's life. Restoration is being fashioned into the condition and the purpose that it was designed for. You understand? See, it's being fashioned into the condition, the quality and the purpose it was designed for. Job was a perfect man, upright, feared God, shunned evil, but his friends got him to make a mistake. It's like a car running to the telephone pole. It's got a ding in it, needs to be restored. How many of you got some dings in your life? Yeah, you need. God wants to restore those. Right back to the highest quality and the highest purpose that he designed us for. Very powerful. And five steps, five actions are taking place here. First, you have to agree and say with your mouth, God is almighty, all powerful. He does what is right in his own eyes. And he has the power to perform what he promised. See, that's the faith that Abraham had. Abraham's faith was, according to the Bible, that God had the power to perform what he promised, and Abraham never seen it. Because God gave Abraham a promise that didn't happen until Christ came. Are you there? All right. But Abraham's faith, and that's what saved him. He was saved by the faith that God has the power to perform what he promises, where he does in your lifetime or not. Is that a good amen? Amen. Now, how many of you can say right now, God is almighty? God is almighty. See, you've got to say it with your mouth. The mouth has a lot to do with getting the things of God in the Bible. Silent saints don't get much. I, I'm, I'm honest. I'm being honest with you. <laughs> you've got to speak. All right? It's part of humbling yourself. You've got to speak to God. Verbally. All right, so Job says, 
Ah, your power can do all things. No purpose of yours can be restrained. Satan can't restrain you. People can't restrain you. Religion can't restrain you. And unbelief cannot restrain you. You do what you decide is right by your power because you're the almighty God. Amen? That's what Job said. In the New Testament, it says, If you acknowledge with your mouth Jesus is Lord, the all-powerful one, the one who has all authority in heaven and earth, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Part of that power is he could die on the cross. No man could take his life. He laid down his life in that fleshly body. And he picked it back up again. That is supernatural power. Amen. And if you say Jesus is Lord. The all powerful one. And you believed he showed it by dying on the cross for your sins. And coming back out of that grave. Then you will be saved. From sin. From sickness, God would save us from the emotional uh, wreck that people get into, having to, you know, fallen apart emotionally. God can save you from your sins. He can save you from anything, and he will. But you've got to acknowledge he has the power to do it and say it with your mouth. All right? Number two, you've got to confess verbally and admit your error, your wrong, your sins, your mistakes, and your faults. Job said, I spoke what I understood not, things too wonderful for me that I knew not. Job did not know there was a <clears throat> court going on in heaven where Satan accused Job and God took Satan up on his accusation and said Job would not lose his integrity. Job would serve me no matter what happens to his life. Job didn't know that went on. And so his friends talked him and he, he did fine at first and then his friends talked him into blaming God. You got to watch your friends. <laughs> In the New Testament, if we confess our sins, He, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we admit we're wrong, how many can say, I'm wrong? I'm wrong. It's really hard. Now, it's not so hard generally, but if you say, I'm wrong when I did this. That is what's hard. We're prideful. We're arrogant. We're stubborn people. And God chooses these simple things of, that humble us. Then he moves in and does the great stuff. Amen? So let's say again, I was wrong. I was wrong. Hallelujah. How many know you can be wrong? Yeah, as, especially young Christians. As a young Christian, I had a lot of weird doctrines that I picked up from radio, TV, and pamphlets and all this stuff. And boy, after reading my Bible and studying my Bible, boy, was I wrong. And I had to go to some of these people, especially at work, and tell them I was wrong. That got wearisome. So I decided... Don't believe anything until I confirm it in the Bible. Then I won't have to go back and say I was wrong all the time. <laughs> Could that be a good amen? Even a fool is wise when he what? Keeps his mouth shut. All right. So, will he cleanse us from all unrighteousness? All unrighteousness? Yeah, even the unpardonable sin. Oh, you stumble over that, huh? He has power, but not the unpardonable sin. Folks, I can show you in the Bible where he forgave the unpardonable sin. All right? His power is total. Amen? So don't say, I'm too difficult, I'm too hard. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing. All right, now. Number three. See with spiritual eyes what your natural ears are hearing. You know that inside of you there is a spirit. And that spirit has a mind. That spirit has emotions. That spirit is just like your body, except it's not a fleshly body. It can think, it can talk. All right? And you need to see with your spiritual person what your natural ears are hearing. All right? We go to Job. <clears throat> I've heard by the hearing of the ear. 
This is Elihu talking to Job and his three friends and straightening them out. He heard Elihu by the hearing of the ear. And Elihu made it plain and clear. You read it, it's plain and clear that he showed them they were wrong. All right. Now, Job says, my eyes see. My spiritual eyes see. Now my spiritual ears hear. You see. And this is what the church has to get back to. People need that encounter with God. I can preach this morning to you, and you can hear with your natural ear, but God can come to you and open up your spiritual understanding and your spiritual eyes. And that makes the difference. And this is why I went to Pentecostal charismatic churches, because they at least tried in every service to bring the presence of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit in their life. I could never go back to fundamentalists and, and other denominations. Once I got filled with the Holy Ghost, there was no turning back. Are you with me? At least these Pentecostals, and, and they, we had our mistakes back there. But so did the other churches. It wasn't like the Pentecostals were the only one making mistakes. <laughs> Amen? Catholics make them, have been making them for hundreds of years. <laughs> the Baptists make them. And so we distorted the baptism of the Holy Ghost a little bit. But let me tell you, it is that encounter with God that does the job. He will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He will lead you into all truth. We need the Holy Ghost in our life. We need that encounter. And when I kept encountering the Holy Spirit with doctrine, I began to understand the Bible. Just because you hear with your ear a message does not mean you heard it in the spiritual man. Could that be true? Yes. We got to watch talking from our intellect instead of our spiritual intellect inside of us. Is that clear? Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> These people's ears in the New Testament, Matthew 13, are calloused of hearing. How do you get a callous? You keep rubbing it, and then it turns into a blister, and then you keep rubbing it, and it keeps building up skin, and finally it's insensitive. You can't even feel anything there anymore. Isn't that right? And when we keep turning off preachers and pamphlets and tracts and all that, we callous our spiritual mind to hearing the Word of God. And we... <clears throat> Close our eyes. Why? Because we want to avoid seeing with our eyes, hearing with our ears, and understanding with our heart, our mind, being converted, and God would heal them. Jesus would heal them. They, they want to stay where they're at. They want to stay understand. They want to stay in their ignorance. And so they turn off. Anything they disagree with, they just turn it off. And pretty soon, they're calloused. They can't hear anymore. See, what I'm trying to show you this morning is what Job experienced in the Old Testament is the same message Jesus brought in the New. <laughs> it's the same message that began at Adam and Eve. Nothing has changed except his death on the cross and the empowerment of the Holy Ghost and uh, amplification of all the scriptures that's been hid since the foundation of the world. Jesus made them all clear. Is that an amen? amen. Now, you've got to dislike your wrong behavior and repent with remorse. You've got to get mad at your wrong behavior. You've got to hate your wrong behavior. When I hate something, I despise it. I have feelings for it. My feelings rise up. Whether it's a person or a, an ideal or a situation or whatever. And so you've got to hate your behavior. He tells us to hate sin. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Evil is wrong behavior. And so we've got to hate our behavior. <clears throat> and know that we can change ourselves. 
or God can change us. Amen? Is this clear? This is powerful. This is very powerful. So, what did Job do? For this reason, I hate my behavior and I repent in dust and ashes. Repent means to turn from the wrong behavior. Okay? So we confess and we turn. <clears throat> I hate my behavior. Can you say I hate my behavior? I hate my behavior. In areas where we're wrong, it's the behavior that's the problem. God doesn't have a problem with you. He has a problem with your behavior. Amen? And he wants to what? Change your behavior. He didn't want to get rid of you. He didn't want to destroy you. He wants to destroy that behavior that you're doing in your life that isn't pleasing to God and it's destroying yourself. Amen? Now, they didn't repent at Elihu's preaching and answers that Elihu gave them. They didn't repent then. They didn't confess. They didn't even admit they were wrong. And we don't either at a lot of preachers good preaching. But when God showed up, they repented. Isn't that beautiful? We need God involved in everything we decide in Christianity. So we know we are making the right action, the right decision. Not by intellect. And not by what your peers say. Not by what your friends say. It's what God says through preachers and then he comes and confirms it by his presence. Amen. Now I, I've given you illustrations of that. And I can't go into that today. <clears throat> but God was right. Job kept his integrity. When he repented. See repentance brings you back. To the quality. And the purpose that you were designed for. And you can repent. You can say you were wrong. You can turn from that wrong. Automatically God forgives, cleanses, and delivers. And you're restored back. You don't miss anything. When you're restored back, there's nothing missing in your life. Amen? It took God. And folks, that's again why I like the spirit-filled circles. Because they allowed the Spirit of God to come and do what man can't do, what preachers can't do, what elders can't do, God can do. He will back up the Word, it says at the end of Mark, and confirming the Word, God will come and do that. Oh, hallelujah. But we can turn Him off. We can close our eyes and close our ears. We can harden our hearts and want to stand on our doctrine till we die. And it's not God's fault. Whose fault is it? It's your fault. <coughs> Number five. You got to forgive your enemies. And that includes yourself. God showed me as a young Christian I was my biggest enemy. <laughs> me, myself, and I was the biggest problem. In my Christian walk. Stubborn, hard-headed, locked in. And that Holy Ghost had to just keep chipping away at me. Just kept chipping away. But you also have people that contribute to your problems. They encourage you to think wrong. They encourage you to believe wrong. But honestly... As a young Christian, I was my biggest enemy. I couldn't blame Satan. I couldn't blame people. It was me, myself, and I that was a locked horns with God every step of the way that he kept bringing me up to his image. Are you with me? <clears throat> so we got to forgive ourselves. And a lot of Christians can't forgive themselves. They can't admit they're wrong, let alone 
forgive themselves for being wrong. <clears throat> and then you've got to pray that your enemies ask God to forgive and save them. You've got to get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on others and pray for others. Pray for yourself and pray for others. Too many Christians are self-centered. It's all about them. Me, me, my, 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 my. Ours and all that. They could care that they never spend time concerning themselves with even speaking the word of God to others, let alone care about the spiritual condition of others. Now this is a big one, folks. When people have hurt you, when people have done you wrong and slandered you, you got to forgive them and you got to pray. You got to show it by praying that you sincerely want God to bring them to the place where they can admit their wrong, ask forgiveness, and God will come to them. Hallelujah. Now, God said to Job, pray for your friends. Okay, Job admitted he was wrong. <clears throat> Job repented. Job had his spiritual eyes open. Job did all these things, and then God said, you got to love your enemies, Job. you got to pray for these three friends of yours that turned you against me. So, James 5, 16, if you forgive, or I'm sorry, Matthew 6, 14, if you forgive men their faults, God will forgive you. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will God forgive your faults or trespasses. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. Now, that doesn't mean the confession booth, all right? <laughs> that means if I did something to Mr. Barnes over here and I realize I did it, I just go to him and say, you know, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that, uh, okay? It's just you and him. Okay, you don't get in a prayer meeting and broadcast everybody's sins uh, like we did back in Pentecostal days. You know, okay, anybody have a prayer? Okay, yeah, my husband drinking, my husband going out and with women, my husband doing this, my husband doing that. My God, everybody's going, well, man, what? that's a horrible guy. When we see him, we hate him. <laughs> and God taught me as a young Christian, don't telegraph people's sin. Tell them to talk to me or someone that has the shoulders to handle it. Amen? So he's not talking about that. And really, you know, you can, I can go to Tony ten times for the same problem and say, oh, Tony, I did it again. Or I don't even have to go to him. I can just correct it. And he knows that I repented and changed because I stopped doing what I was doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, we, we, we like the theatrics, but simple action is way ahead of any theatrics that we can give. And we feel comfortable. Catholics feel comfortable going to a confession booth or something, and, and, and you know, Pentecostals, they feel comfortable about, uh, you know, admitting their sins and everything publicly, and I was on drugs, and I was a sexual maniac, and I was, uh, uh, uh. That doesn't do anybody any good. <laughs> In fact, they elevated, during the hippie time, they elevated hippies so high that they were in drugs and in sexual permissiveness, sexual rebellion, you know, that came during that time and all this stuff. And they would bring them up to the front and they would give their testimony and God changed their life. So what happened to the kids in the church that grew up in the church? They don't bring us up. We don't have a testimony. My goodness, so what do they do? They run out to get a testimony. I, I, I was there. Amen? Your testimony is you live your life. You don't want to be going around yakking everybody in the world and, uh, that you did some great thing by turning from drugs and debauchery. Could that be an amen? Now, ah, so we need to confess our sins to Jesus. 
And at times we need to go to somebody that we've offended and get things right. But the best thing is what? Just change and everybody will see it. So, Job's health is restored. Job's source of wealth is restored. He gets 10 new children. His friends are restored. His wife is restored. Even though she wanted him dead, she hung in there. He didn't have any more money, so she wasn't after his money. And I, don't know, I mean, he did have a savings, obviously, because he was a wise man. But he lost his source of income. All right? And she hung in there. <clears throat> All of these were restored. Back to the designed condition. When Job prayed for his friends. And the friends accepted Job's prayer. And changed. Folks, this is so powerful. I, I got to have your attention here for a minute. Not only was Job restored, but his enemies were restored. Disharmony in his home was restored. And his income was restored. And not only that, His relatives came back. See, they weren't there yet. They weren't there this whole time. This could not have happened any more than a year because you remember these guys traveled a long way to get to Job and they had to travel back and they had families at home and all that, especially the young guy, Elihu. You understand? This was not a long duration. And your tragedies don't happen don't have to happen for year and year and year. It can be just long enough to get you straightened out. That's a good amen. It's not how many bricks you can hold before you break. Just break at the first brick. Just change. All that new Job, all of his acquaintances, they weren't around. But when he prayed for his friends and God was involved, they came to Job. <clears throat> his scoffers, the ones that ridiculed him, came. These people making fun of the church and making fun of you for serving God. God's after the whole bunch. Are you here this morning? Not just you, he's after the whole group. And he has the power to do this. They came to comfort Job. Yeah, he's healthy now, and they come to comfort him. <laughs> Things have changed, and they come to comfort him. Okay, everything's okay. I mean, you know, it's easy to do things when things are easy. Yes, you got to have commitment to do things when things are difficult. They ate with Job, and they gave him money and a piece of gold, and that it's what Job invested and built his wealth back up. These people that mocked him, the relatives that left him, no one would have anything to do with him but his three friends and Elihu and God. And God had backed off from Job for a year here. Job had no communication with God. Have you ever gone through a dry time where God seemed way off? That dry seasons. And some people don't know what a dry season is because they've been on one ever since they got saved. <laughs> it's true. I know people that haven't ever encountered God. And they'll attack the Pentecostals for shaking or something like that, you know. And, uh, and they, they, don't even know, they don't even touch anything to shake. Are you with me? Now, Job was added 165 years. Now, folks, here's the power of this. Remember I showed you in Ephesians 
till we all come to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, unto a perfect man, a measure and statue of Christ. Remember that? And remember I told you, how can Christ come today or tomorrow when this is not fulfilled? I want to show you today, Job fulfilled this. God brought the scoffers, his enemies, and Job and his wife back in to unity. Now, if he can do that with Job and those around him, can he do it before he comes? Can he? Can God do everything? Is anything impossible for him? No. So why do we believe this stuff? Why do we limit God? Because we don't hear. We never dig out teachers that are really teaching the whole counsel of God. We stay in our little circles and that's all we hear. The same stuff over and over and over. And it gets into us. And we get callous to hearing anything else. But this morning you've seen clearly it takes God to get us to repent. Isn't that right? Amen. Preachers can preach till doomsday, but until you touch your God, Basically, you're not going to repent and change because he is the convictor of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 